I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing On Air. The short play, John William Finn, is adapted for the stage and is performed by stage and screen actor Stephen Lang, whom you might know best as Colonel Quaritch from the movie Avatar. Jeremy Davidson of TV's Army Wives plays the military voice in this piece. Chief Petty Officer John William Finn was at Naval Air Station Kaneohe Bay on the island of Oahu in Hawaii when it was attacked on the morning of Sunday, December 7, 1941, for manning a machine gun from an exposed position throughout the attack. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Bastards! Screwed up Manuki on a Sunday morning. I was after some love with my beautiful wife. What a sadness to God what I was doing when they come. Oh, everybody said later that so-and-so come and awaken me. Hell, the only people asleep were the morons in Washington who didn't advise the Admiral as to what was coming off. It was my little pal Woodrow awakened me that morning. Citation for extraordinary heroism and devotion above and beyond. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on there, sunshine. Let's don't rush through the damn thing. Like I said... About the time I saw the plane flash by my window, I'm laying in bed with a a pup tent situation, you know what I mean, and my wife, Alice, oh, she jumps out of bed and she's looking out the window at Hawaii Olo Hill and she says, oh, John, it's beautiful, and I'm looking at her beautiful little ass, and I said, it sure is. Above and beyond the call of duty, during the first attack by- Belay that sailor, by God. My name is John Finn and I'm 97 years old and it's my turn to talk. Now I'm going to talk for a while, then you can make a big damn fuss over me. That worked for you? Sir. All right, then. Damn. He looked like he'd about 13. I was 16 when I went down to the recruiting station. I thought, oh, shit, a few weeks don't make any difference. You want know, to give me the uh, exam, give me the physical. Recruiter says, how are your teeth? I said, I've got pretty good teeth. I had beautiful teeth. Still do. Yeah. Okay, all right, Sonny. You come on back in two weeks and you bring your mother and your father with you. Well, I come back. I come back on the 29th of July, 1927. I'm just 17 and I brought my mother with me. And, oh, my God. They treated her like she was a queen. Yeah, they got her a cup of coffee and set her down a chair. No, oh, it was wonderful. Now come this tough-looking sailor. Son, he says, you sure you won't join the Navy? You know you got to scrub your own clothes. You realize in the Navy you got to stand a lot of watches. You don't get to sleep all night, all the time. You understand that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that bothered me. No. Oh, only one thing worried me. Yeah, they give me a, 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 a leaflet, and it says, the Navy food is wholesome, but plain. Yeah, that worried me. I thought I was going to be eating rice and boiled potatoes with no salt for three years, but, well, I wanted to join the Navy. And then when I got to boot camp, oh, my God, I love the Navy. <laughs> Sliced roast beef and gravy, lettuce and tomato salad, watermelon and corn on the cob. Oh, man, I just, I, I couldn't believe the food. Oh, sure, sure. I remember some numb nuts complaining about the goddamn Navy slop, but shit, I never got such good food in my life as I got on the Navy. I, I thought I died and went to heaven. Goddamn rice and boiled potatoes. 32. Got back from China, saw a beautiful blonde in San Diego. After all them little Chinese gals in China, beautiful blonde. I said, God, do something about that. Alice, I said, her name was Alice. Alice, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. But I got to tell you, I haven't ridden this bike much. See, I bought a BMW in China. And maybe, maybe you better go with Bobby or with Slim. And she says, I want to go with you. So (laughs) off we go. And we just, well, we just rode round. But then, then I feel a, 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 a tremor. On the back of the bike, what the hell is that? What do you know? This girl is now standing up on the pack rack on the bike, got the tips of her fingers on my shoulders, and she is standing up, and I'm thinking, Jesus Christ, she's got some guts. This beautiful blonde is the last girl in the world you're going to be playing tricks on a motorcycle. Well, we just, we rode long like that, not going fast, maybe 20, oh, 25 miles an hour, and oh my. She was muscular and strong and graceful and everything. We got married in in 33. So, you got to understand, on that morning, December 7, 
1941. I'd been in the Navy 15 years, and I'd participated in all kind of war games. I mean, you live at a naval station, you hear planes flying, but then, then you hear the damn machine guns. Who the hell is firing machine guns? I'm chief ordnance man around here. If anybody is firing machine guns, I don't know about it. And then I thought, hey, hey, what the hell is happening here? It's Sunday. Whew. Uh, uh, okay, sunshine, you can fill in a few details. Sir. Lieutenant Finn promptly secured and manned a 50 caliber machine gun in a completely exposed area, which was under heavy enemy machine gun strafing fire. Although painfully wounded many times... Ah, all right, all right, all right. That's fine. It's right. Well, pretty much right. But you got to understand, by the time I got to the hangars, the enemy were reducing every plane on the field to a rubble of smoke and melted aluminum. And then, then you hear a plane roaring in astern of me, and I look up, and I see the big old red meat pot. The rising sun insignia on the underside of the wing. So what it did was, I grabbed a 30, it was a 30 caliber machine gun, and oh my God, did they fire fast, and I drug that son of a gun out onto the tarmac, maybe 20 yards, so I could see over the hangars, and I started firing. And for the next two hour and a half, I fired that gun. I fired that gun, till the last of them left. And not every one of them did leave. And that's a fact. Now, of course, there were some lulls, at which time I would hasten back to my armory and assess the damage and kick somebody in ass and grab some fresh ammo. So now I'm slapping a fresh belt on that 30, and I look up, and I see these little black mice turds coming towards me, and I said, fuck. And I outrun those bombs. I jumped in the stairwell, and I didn't hit the deck, for I heard these three big crash and rolling horrendous explosions. Boom! 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 Concrete and glass was coming down. A ton of glass fell on me. Woo. Although painfully wounded many times. Understand, I'm not the only sailor catching this shit. Oh, no, no, by no means. Christian Guinness and Bucky Walters were both badly injured. Oh, yes, Christian was trying to jerk the hangar doors open when the bombs hit and the concussion from the blast blew the doors all to hell and smashed every damn bone in his hands. Oh, he had to walk around for months with little splints on each finger. Then when them splints come off, he walked around squeezing tennis balls. And after that, they sent him to making macrame. How about that? He made a beautiful red, white, and blue belt for Alice. Square knot, nice mother of pearl. Oh, she wore it for quite a while. Alice had a real slim little waist. Uh, okay. Although painfully wounded many times, he continued to man his gun and return the enemy's fire vigorously and with complete disregard for his own personal safety. Well, I would matter in hell. I wouldn't be courageous. All I was doing was I, I, I got pissed off. I was doing exactly what I thought I would do if there ever come a war. Now, maybe I didn't have sense enough to come in out of the rain, but I can truthfully say that I don't remember being scared to death. But I was damn mad. No sex, no breakfast. Anger, hunger, sex. Greatest instincts we got. Things we're born with. What else is there? It was Nimitz, the Admiral Nimitz, hung the medal around my neck. He says, Finn, it gives me great pleasure to hang this medal around your neck. September 1542, board the SS Enterprise, in Pearl. A lot of fellows got decorated that afternoon, and rightfully so, but um, mine was the only Medal of Honor presented to an individual who fired back at the enemy that day, and I am proud of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, let's see, I... Uh, Oh, I, I retired from active duty in, in 47. Yeah, I spent some time in the junk business. Then, then in 58, I moved on to 93 acres of California scrubs. See, I wanted a place where I could ride my motorcycles and shoot my guns on my own property and collect my junk. Alice and I are together 66 years. Alice died December 17, 1998. Healthy as a pig, she just torn up by arthritis. She's 88 when she died. She was ready to go. She lived a good, long life. Yeah. Sir? Yeah. Oh, time to move on, is it? Finn, John William, Lieutenant U.S. Navy. His extraordinary heroism and conduct in this action at Naval Air Station, Kaneohe Bay, Territory of Hawaii, 7 December 1941, were in keeping with the highest traditions of the U.S. Naval Service. That's my story. Good one, ain't it? You just heard John William Finn, adapted and performed by Stephen Lang. Jeremy Davison played the military voice. 
Thank you, Stephen Lang, for being here. John William Finn. The Empire of Japan had not declared war when they attacked Pearl Harbor. It was a territory of the U.S. It wasn't the state of Hawaii yet. It was 7.48 on a Sunday morning when the planes started shooting and John Finn was in bed with his wife Alice. Was she in danger? Everyone was in, in danger. I suppose the uh, what they had, their danger was less because he was living off base. He was a married um, uh, head of ordinance there, and so he had an apartment just off base, not far at all. But they heard planes going by, and then, and which which would be unusual probably, but but not completely out of the question. But then to hear machine gun fire at 7 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning, that's not supposed to happen. And also, nobody's supposed to be firing machine guns unless he gives the the, the, the go-ahead. So, uh, sure, everybody was in, in danger right. there. You know? he was I mean, in look at how many right. people died. There. Uh, speaking of which, the Japanese only lost 29 men. And he was responsible for some of the loss there, right. which was... And compared to the U.S., which lost 2,403, I mean, Mm -hmm. so can you tell us a little bit more about what happened that morning in terms of the U.S. damage and... Well, the harbor, I mean, all the ships in the harbor were were hit. Of course, the Arizona and a number of others went down. And uh, men never had a chance because it was a sneak attack is what it was. It was uh, very effective and uh, they could not have done anything uh, that would have served to mobilize uh, war sentiment in the United States any more than they did there. But, I mean, you know, what went down at Pearl Harbor is very, very well documented and uh, filmed. It was a, a very tragic, one of the most tragic days in United States history, for sure. That's why I felt it was really appropriate to open um, Beyond Glory with uh, December 7, 1941. The, the incidents that earn Medal of Honor recipients their citations are usually harrowing and traumatic. And we hear of PTS, post-traumatic stress syndrome, quite a bit these days. Have any of the Medal of Honor recipients mentioned PTS? Not in so many words. Um, but... Uh, there, it's clear that because you're a Medal of Honor recipient, in no way makes you immune from the horrors that you've experienced. In a way, it can really uh, almost exacerbate it because you are being lionized for uh, things where your buddies all died. Because, as you say, the Medal of Honor, by definition, is a harrowing experience in which, you know, a life or death situation, and usually there are many deaths involved. We view these men as heroes. But because you earn the Medal of Honor, it doesn't mean that you, you, you know, are some upstanding, fantastic, uh, our idea of what a hero should be, Captain America, something like this. Some of these guys have all kinds of problems, the same kind of problems that the rest of us have, it seems to me. So, they're a very interesting group. That's why one of the reasons I wanted to do this, not to talk about the event itself, but to talk about the lives that they've, that they've lived right. in a way and how their lives become defined by that event. To me, the action of the, of, for which someone receives the Medal of Honor is the pebble in the pond of their life, reflecting both their history and their future. Because once you, that medal is put around your neck, it's always on, you know, because it carries responsibility with it. Right. So it's even harder to reveal vulnerabilities and, than it would be for someone who wasn't lionized. But I, I will also say that, that there is confidence and a pride uh, and a sense of uh, fortitude and fiber in all of the Medal of Honor recipients that I have met. In their own way, they are very singular guys. There is a book called Beyond Glory by a gentleman named Larry Smith. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you happened to read this book and, I guess, on the spot, decided to somehow turn it into a theatrical piece? Larry Smith was a basketball buddy of mine. played every Sunday morning. Now, I didn't know what Larry did, just as I don't know what a lot of the guys in the game do. We get together on Sunday morning to play basketball at 6.30 a.m., which tended to always keep you sober on Saturday night. And uh, 
anyway, one day we're lacing on our sneakers, and uh, I said, um, what do you, you know, just, and I don't even know why I said it. It was like, what do you do, Larry? He said, I'm retired. And I said, well, what are you retired from? He said, well, I was managing editor of Parade Magazine, which was like totally surprising shocking to me I, I you know i had no idea what i thought he was but wow really so what are you doing now that you're tired well i've written a book really about what uh well it's about the medal of honor and it's going to come out in in um, six weeks and i said i'd really love to to read it and he said yeah well good <laughs> anyway the next week he brought an uncorrected copy for me and I remember I went home after the game, I opened my bag with all my sweaty stuff in it, and there's the book, and I take it out, and I'm standing in my living room in my, you know, my gym shorts, and I, uh, I just, you know, the way you just sort of open a book, you're not going to read it, but anyway, three hours later, I'm still standing there reading this book, and it just, it just, um, uh, it just grabbed me, and uh, so that night I began working on it, and then I... I said to him the next week, I said, you know, you got time to get together for a cup of coffee and everything like that. And so we did, and I told him what I'd done, and he was like, really? Why don't we do it together? That's fantastic. So if you had to say what percentage of the words you say in these pieces were actually spoken by the, those real people? Mm -hmm. Somewhere around 85%. I change, when I, when I can make it better, I change it. You know, like, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, John Finn. Uh, in the show, I say, of course, there were lulls at which time I would hasten back to my armory. Now, Finn never said hasten back to my armory. He said, I'd go back. I went back to the armory. Well, to me, it hasten back to the armory just gave it, it it's what he should have said. <laughs> it just gives it a slightly antique feel. It says poetically it works for me. So I have absolutely no compunction about doing that when, whenever is necessary. I don't change the facts ever, you know. If students wanted to perform your play, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? Well, how would I counsel them to do it? You know, tell the truth. You know, just uh, don't be afraid to never, just plunge right in. You gotta, you can't be, when I was rehearsing this thing, I just would bounce off the walls with it uh, because it's all a process of finding it. Eventually it's gonna find itself. Uh, eventually you find that place where you and the character uh, come together and, uh, and meet. Thank you, Stephen Lang. You've been listening to Playing On Air, great American short plays with great American actors. Portrayals of Medal of Honor recipients are from the play Beyond Glory by Stephen Lang, adapted from the book of the same name by Larry Smith. Recording by John Kilgore. Sound design by Ron Rogel. Theme music by Tom Cochan. Assistant producer, Sasha Spitzer. Literary manager, Sanford Wilson. Visit our website at playingonair.org, find us on Facebook or Twitter at Playing On Air, and subscribe to our podcast. And let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm series producer Claudia Catania. <laughs> <laughs>